Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shithij Kapoor. I'm the president and principal of King's College London, and a very warm welcome to all of you. It's wonderful to see so many colleagues and friends of King's here in person, and I understand there's quite a few uh, number of people who are online too. So welcome if you're here in person or online. Now, one of the privileges of, of being the president of King's College London is that one can lend one's title to some lectures and seminars of great importance. And as I was looking forward to this academic year, I thought uh, it is very critical that they, we have a presidential series on academic freedom. Now you might wonder what's new this year. Well, the first thing is you can open any newspaper and I can assure you in a week, you will find that there will be some article or the other uh, accusing one university or the other of somehow being on the wrong side of academic freedom or freedom of speech. But that's just the newspapers you might say, well, they all, always need sensational stories to sell themselves. But then you come to the House of Lords. There is a bill currently in front of the House of Lords on the freedom of speech. And then just last week, I was actually surprised that the wreath lectures, the BBC wreath lectures, Chimamanda mm -hmm. Adichie, her talk, was on freedom of speech. So whether we like it or not, the world is talking about it. Whether we like it or not, the world is often implicating universities in not doing what they should uh, in upholding academic freedom. Um, so that is why I thought it was very important that we get together and talk about it, because I felt that there was much more talk about <coughs> academic freedom happening in the world out there than was happening by the academics within the university. So it is wonderful to see you here, because in the end, it is not an academic matter for academics. I think the concept of academic freedom is a social concept for the betterment of all of society, and I think that's the way that we have to look at it, that it isn't a special privilege like a library card for academics to go do something only within the university. The reason academic freedom is and should be pro pro protected is because it's a public good. But it's interesting then to take a moment to reflect to how we got here. Um, the concept of academic freedom as we know it in modern Western universities actually arose as public funding for Western universities got around. And the issue was how would you give immunity to the professors? How would you protect them from the political forces of the time? So in some sense, the very idea of academic freedom arose is to give the academics, the latitude, the space, to think ideas which may not be in favor with the current government or with the current political or social, social environments. So I find it very interesting in that regard that it is the government of the day that is actually fighting for more academic freedom. Because history would tell you it's the other way around. It's the universities that are asking, or it's academics who are asking for academic freedom. And usually it's the forces beyond them which are trying to suppress them. So we have to ask ourselves that how in UK did we get into the situation that it would be a conservative government that would be asking for more academic freedom in universities? But howsoever we got there, I think in the current dialogue, I often find that two things get confused. Freedom of speech and academic freedom. Freedom of speech is a civil right. You know, you can trace it all the way back to the French Revolution when we first started exerting the right of every citizen to be able to speak their mind freely without fear of oppression. And freedom of speech is, is actually guaranteed to you in law so long as you're not defaming someone or discriminating or indulging in hate speech. It is a right you have. It is a right you have outside of the boundary of the university. It's the right you have in the university. It's a right you have whether you're an academic or not. Academic freedom, I think, is a more nuanced concept. Academic freedom is not just freedom of speech for academics within the university boundaries. I think academic freedom arose to especially protect the rights of academics to research, to teach, and to profess in areas where they had scholarly expertise. So there was special latitude given, special protection given to their jobs, to what they had to say, because it was felt that they were bringing a public good through their scholarship. So the question for us is that if academic freedom is to mean more than just freedom of speech for academics, what are the boundary conditions? 
What is this idea of a scholarly enterprise? Who gets to define it? Who gets to police it? Who gets to monitor it? And I think all of us have an interest in helping define that. And lastly, of course, um, as of last count, there are 28,000 universities or higher education institutions in this world. I would say a small minority of them are in Western liberal democracies. What does academic freedom mean in many different parts of the world? Because at one level, you know, we proudly say students from 194 countries come to Kings. We also take pride that, you know, scholars from over 80 countries are represented in our faculties in different ways. But if academic freedom has no universal definition and is different in every socio-political context, how do we reconcile a world where students and academics and knowledge moves around, but academic different academic freedom is different in every jurisdiction. So look, I've just highlighted two or three issues about this that, that uh, intrigue me and excite me. I am sure there are many more issues that you will hear about, and that is why we needed a presidential seminar series, not just a seminar, but a series on this. And I think on this note, it is my pleasure to then hand it over uh, to Professor Linda Woodhead, who will be chairing our first presidential seminar on this matter. She's the F.T. Morris Professor of Moral and Social Theology. I think I got well that done. right, Linda. Well With that, over to you, and a very warm welcome to all the colleagues who are here and those who are online. Thank you very much. There you go. Do you need this? I uh, know. Thank you so much, and thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to people online for tuning in. Uh, you've just heard why this is a very important and extremely timely debate. And it's my great honor to be chairing it. And we've got a fantastic lineup of speakers to address these issues. Let me briefly introduce them to you. First of all, Professor Livio Matte, who must take a lot of credit for organizing this, is going to give us a, a context scene setting paper. Then we're going to move to our panel. And we're going to start with David Locke. David. David is Secretary General of the Magna Charta Universitatum. We're then going to shift online and we're going to hear from Tamires Sampaio, who is joining us from Sao Paulo in Brazil. And she is a lawyer and a former vice president of the Brazilian Students Union. We're also going to move online then to talk with Claire Robinson, who is the advocacy director of the Scholars at Risk Network and the lead author of their reports on free to think. And then finally, we're absolutely delighted to have a great expert on this subject, Professor Terence Caron, Professor of Higher Education Policy from the University of Lincoln joining us. We will then move at 6.30 to half an hour of Q&A, and we have a firm determination to finish at 7, and we've got a reception, which I hope you can join us in after that. So, if you, may I hand over to you for your presentation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Linda. Thank you all for joining in person on, on, and online. And uh, thank you, Chitish, for hosting this, uh, this uh, series. Reimagining academic freedom. So how, how, do we, how do we get there? So um, I have been asked to, to write a longer background paper. It is almost six pages long. And that will be available on the mini site of this series together with all other uh, documents, uh, PowerPoints. And we want to keep the, that uh, um, web page, mini site alive throughout this uh, entire series so that we can have follow up. So I'm, I'm, I'll try to be, uh, to, be, to be brief. So charting a course for, for academic freedom. I am making this argument that we are at a time in history, in the history of higher education, where we need to think about charting a new course for academic freedom. And when I use these uh, uh, words, charting a course, that's obviously a metaphor. And what I have in mind is something similar to what a ship captain does when charting, plotting a course for a vessel to navigate uh, uh, across the seas, or uh, you know, a captain also charting a course for, for a flight in, in, in the sky. So they need a reference. They need a compass. They need a framework of reference, inertial or, or otherwise. And the argument that, that, that I am making, and I expect that some will disagree, is that we have lost a little bit the compass. 
when we talk about academic uh, freedom, or we have compass, but the needle goes in a little bit in, in all directions. And in order to be able to chart a new course out of the present state of academic freedom and related practices, we need to reimagine academic freedom. So uh, why there is a need to reimagine academic freedom more, more precisely? What does that even mean, reimagining academic freedom? And in this regard, going back to also to what our president said, what is the place and the responsibility of the university? What can the university do? And what can one particular university do, like us here at, uh, uh, at King's? So I would like to propose for discussion two reasons for reimagining uh, academic freedom, two arguments. One is that I believe we lack currently a conceptual reference for academic freedom that is up to date, shared and effective. And I will, I will try to provide some evidence for this uh, statement. And secondly, perhaps a little more, uh, more surprising is that a rethinking of academic freedom is actually already happening. Only that without, this is happening without universities playing a role or a major role. These are processes led primarily by public authorities, sometimes international organizations. And this, the fact that universities are absent might have long-term undesirable uh, consequences. So I also perhaps should stop for a moment and say, uh, and I used a few times the phrase conceptual reference for academic freedom. By this, I don't mean a definition a one line or a stark definition, but really a complex understanding, a conceptual elaboration that serves really as a reference for the codification, regulation, and practice of, uh, of academic uh, freedom. So, so what is wrong with the existing conceptual references for, for, uh, for, for academic uh, freedom? Well, this is what is wrong, that they are either not up to date, not shared enough, or not effective, or sometimes a combination of this. Um, Shit has already mentioned the Humboldtian model of, uh, of academic freedom, which emerged in the early 19th century in, in, in Prussia, and he explained uh, the context a little bit. This model has been extremely influential over more than two centuries now, and in a positive way. It has supported the advancement of higher education and research uh, in, in ways that no other conceptual reference has done. But it is outdated because it was uh, developed uh, in the context of the emergence of the nation states in Europe when the concern was really about how the state should protect the university work from external interference, including from the restrictive interference of the state itself. Uh, Humboldt, and it wasn't only Humboldt, as a matter of fact, not only Wilhelm or Humboldt, were not concerned about uh, supranational threats to academic freedom as we know them today, because they are not there, right? Either they result from simple international cooperation or geopolitical realities. They were not concerned with sub-state threats to academic freedom, including from the university itself, as we know them today. So that's why I'm saying this is outdated, or at least partially outdated. We have also the very influential the, uh, statements on academic freedom of the American University of uh, University Professors, uh, American Association of University Professors, 1915, revised a few times, 1940. Most importantly, that reference is linked to a particular constitutional system, and more precisely, to a constitutional amendment in the United States. So it's very difficult to translate it in other jurisdictions. Plus, it has some other challenges as well. You might be familiar with Florida legislation adopted uh, recently, which says uh, the right of parents to decide what their children's study is more important than freedom of, uh, freedom of uh, speech, as uh, you know, uh, regulated in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the amendment. Then there is another reference that we tend to forget about that belongs to not being shared or not being known, the UN International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which is a universal human rights instrument, includes very powerful and good references to freedom of education, freedom of research. This is a very good reference and also has played a major positive role in recent uh, history, but it is very difficult to enforce in courts. 
and it also covers only part of the spectrum that should be covered by academic freedom. You know, it's a human rights instrument. If we are talking, for example, of a situation when uh, head of school tells a colleague in that school, well, based on if you use this uh, research method, you'll never get a promotion. I mean, the uh, individual concern cannot claim, oh, it's my human right to do it. It just doesn't apply. Right? So it doesn't cover the, the entire spectrum there. The UNESCO recommendation concerning the status of higher education teaching personnel, very recent, very comprehensive. Some in the rooms have taken part in drafting this, uh, uh, not me, in this, uh, this uh, definition. But you know, it was adopted by 100 plus countries, ratified, made part of the national legislation of more than 100 countries. Almost nobody knows it. As a matter of fact, it is not applied. You know, it is really comprehensive. It, it covers you know, aspects that no other reference covers, like protection of employment, for example, for, 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 uh, for academics. So not effective. It is not outdated, but not effective. And then you know, we have in the European Union, if I may say, UI, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which uh, includes a very short reference, academic freedom shall be respected. When the European Court of Justice tried to use this reference in a case, European Commission against Hungary, it wasn't possible. It just didn't work. Right? So that speaks again for, so I won't go uh, longer uh, on, on, on this list. This is just some evidence for my statement that uh, we might not have an up-to-date shared and effective conceptual reference. So these are now examples, because I mentioned some rethinking is happening as a matter of fact, and universities are largely absent. And these are some examples. Magna Carta Universitatum, and David is running the Magna Carta Observatory, a very influential document adopted in 1988 and revised already in 2020. I should say it focused more on university autonomy than academic freedom, but the fact that it was revised beginning in 2015, I believe, speaks for the need to revise it. To, to, no, to, to rethinking. The Rome Statement on Academic Freedom, so uh, this is probably the most important development in academic freedom in terms of conceptualization of academic freedom before regulation in Europe. 48 countries, UK included, signed up. Also Russia and Belarus and Germany and Norway. And very interestingly, it frames academic freedom as a value not as a right, fundamental right, human right, not as a governance principle that much, as a value. And why, it's very interesting why it was framed as a value, but what does it mean in practice? And also, I think there is one, uh, one uh, uh, part of this statement, which I should uh, uh, say I helped draft, was that the, the definition of academic freedom is made in terms of precondition for the universities to deliver on their core mission, which is the production, transmission, dissemination, curation of knowledge as a public good. So I think that is a very important reference, knowledge as a public good, which you know, I expect will play a very important role in, in, the, in the discussions that we are having in Europe and, and beyond regarding the conceptualization of academic freedom. Yet another effort, the Science and Technology Panel of the European Parliament started the process with the ambition to amend the very treaty of the EU, that's the closest there is to a constitution of the European Union, to include academic freedom. I'm, not sure that will succeed, I and mean, there are colleagues online who are now listening, so I shouldn't discourage them. But this is also an attempt to create legislation, because what the European Union has at present is, is, is not enough. And you know, this is fascinating to study, let alone do, be part of it, in particular because the European Parliament doesn't have a mandate on issues of education. In, uh, under the subsidiarity principle in the only in research. So this, if anything, in the EU, EU treaty about uh, academic freedom, it will be only about research. So what will be the consequences of that in, 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 in Europe, right? And I can, I can go on, perhaps I should say only one, uh, one other thing about the UK bill on higher education, freedom of speech, uh, uh, Shitij already mentioned that. I mean, there was a lot of discussion. Is this a legitimate? process. Does the government hold the right to legislate on academic freedom? And my answer is, of course. 
the government has not only public authorities more generally have not only the right but even the obligation to protect academic freedom and if that requires legislation yes because academic freedom sends to a public good which is knowledge so the government has to act on behalf of the public to protect academic freedom and if that requires legislation so it be the problem here and she did again explained is that this bill reduces, misconstrues academic freedom as freedom of speech alone. We wrote a, a, an article about that. There is more to that. It, well, it doesn't state explicitly, but it implies that academic freedom is only of the staff, not of the students, for example, which is problematic, or even administrative uh, staff of the, of the university should be included within the, the scope of, of academic. So this is happening. You haven't heard much about universities having played a role in this. I should say Magna Carta Universi Universitatum was a, perhaps if not a university-led effort, an effort on behalf of, in the name of university. And the last one, the list here, is the only effort that I know to generate, to contribute to the reconceptualization of, uh, of academic freedom that comes from a university that was done by the Academic Freedom and Internationalization Working Group here in the UK. And I believe there are colleagues, I mean, there are certainly colleagues here who have, who have, who have worked with this. So I think I should, uh, I should uh, move ahead a little uh, faster. Right? I have a couple more minutes. So, so what can universities do? Well, universities, a little, a little back, universities can contribute research for this discussion, including what I would call applied research, research that is immediately relevant for this effort of reimagining, reconceptualizing academic freedom. And I won't go to an example here. I might go back to that in the discussion. Universities also, I believe, could create inclusive platform for discussing challenges to, to academic freedom. And not only discussing, we don't want this series to be a, a series of talk shows, but discussing about how to address these challenges and contribute effectively to addressing them. And by inclusive platform, we mean a place where all internal constituencies in the, of the university should be represented, students, academic staff, administrative staff, leadership, also the world of higher education policy, government, public authorities, the press, perhaps the public as well. I'm not sure I would know how to do that, for, for example, but that, that, is, that is a question. And also not only the West or Europe or the, or the, or the UK, but other parts of the world uh, as well. So just to, to finish, this is what we are trying to, to do uh, through this uh, uh, entire series, which will last for a year, I mean, we are not going to meet every week, not, not even every, every month, but it, this is imagined as a sustained effort that might not lead to a new conceptual reference for academic freedom, but I hope, we hope that it might lead at least to uh, a set of principles for reimagining academic freedom, which you know, we might call eventually the king's principle for reimagining academic freedom in a, in a year from now, in, in fall 2023. Thank you very much. Livy, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for setting us that challenge. And, and thanks to Shittij and Livy for setting us off so well and laying out the context. We're going to move straight away to the first of our panel members, and that's David Locke. David, we've just been hearing a lot about your Magna Carta and how important it is. Can you tell us more, please? I'm very happy to do that. And uh, as Livy has said, Magna Carta Observatory um, has, five years ago, revised what was the seminal document across the world into a new Magna Carta. And I'll tell you why we did that. Um, but before I do that, I should probably say just a little bit about what the Magna Carta is what the original said about academic freedom, where we've got to, and then come back to the question that you set us this evening. The Magna Carta Observatory exists, and I quote, to play an active role in guaranteeing the respect, protection, and promotion of the fundamental values and university rights established by the Magna Carta Universitatum which was first signed in Bologna by 388 universities, uh, or their rectors, in 1988. And 1988 was the 900th anniversary of the University of Bologna. Now, 
It was an initiative by universities. All right. It was actually written in Latin by eight male rectors of European universities. And I'll come to the significance of that later on. Now, academic freedom is the third of four principles that are stated. And again, let me read it so no misinterpretation. Freedom, and bear in mind this is translated into English from the Latin. There are one or two sort of strange phrases, all right? Freedom in research and training is the fundamental principle of university life. And governments and universities, each as far as in them lies, must ensure respect for this fundamental requirement. Rejecting intolerance <coughs> and always open to dialogue, a university is an ideal meeting ground for teachers capable of imparting their knowledge and well equipped to develop it by research and innovation and for students entitled, able and willing to enrich their minds with that knowledge. Now, that Magna Carta Universitatum, MCU for short, from 1988, served very well for 30 years. And there was growing support for it. Um, as at last month, uh, some 960 universities from 94 different countries have signed either that or the new one or both. All right, so quite a lot of growth from the start. So what has changed which caused the Magna Carta Observatory to review the, uh, the Magna Carta? Well, the world has become interconnected in, a way, in ways that were unimaginable at the time of the original Magna Carta. Universities, as your president was saying, have proliferated around the globe, dramatically increasing in number, in variety, as well as their scope and their mission. Globally, the number and diversity of students seeking a university education has increased, as have their reasons for doing so, and the expectations of their families and communities. The number of publications has increased enormously, while trust in academia has been eroded by a loss of confidence in expertise. With new technology, modes of learning, teaching and research are changing rapidly. Universities are both leading and responding to these developments and despite these changes, the potential of higher education to be a positive agent of change and social transformation endures. Hence, 2017, Magna Carta Observatory started a process of international consultation as a prelude to revising that 1988 document. Now, time does not permit me to go through all that we found from that, but sufficient to say that universities prioritised different values and there were different interpretations of the concept of academic freedom in different regions of the world, arising from their different cultures, geography and history. Now, what resulted out of this process was a new Magna Carta Universitatum, drafted by a more diverse, globally represented group. It contained students, it contained women, um, it, was, it reflected universities much more accurately. 
And what resulted was Magna Carta Universitatum 2020, or MCU 2020 for short. Now, this took nothing away from the 1988 document, but it added several clauses as to how universities might form a reliable social contract with civil society. Now, regarding academic freedom, what 2020 says is this. As they create and disseminate knowledge, universities question dogmas and established doctrines and encourage critical thinking in students and scholars. Academic freedom is their lifeblood, open inquiry and dialogue, their nourishment. Now, realising that signing a document, signing a declaration, is by no means sufficient alone, what Magna Carta has also done, and this is perhaps a topic for another night, is to develop its Living Values Project. Now, it developed that to assist universities in ensuring that their values were the right ones for them, that their staff and students are both involved in their development and delivery, and that their university operates and delivers in accordance with their values. So, to return to the question, our exam question for tonight, is there a need to reimagine academic freedom? The global experience of the Magna Carta Observatory is that the concept remains sound, but it needs to be exercised effectively in the cultural context of each university. If it is to, in the words of Magna Carta 2020, strengthen the role of universities in the preservation of the planet and promoting health, prosperity and enlightenment around the world. David, thanks so much for uh, doing exactly what I asked you to do and giving us an idea of that and the complexity there is in, in the globalisation of this concept. Um, it's very apt that we should move now online to Tamira Sampaio, who's joining us from Brazil and is able to give a perspective from outside of this country. We're extremely grateful to you for giving the time to do this. Um, you've also got a lot of experience working with students, so we're looking forward enormously to hearing your contribution. Uh, you have about five minutes. I'll, I'll give you a five-minute warning um, to uh, open, open the discussion from Brazil. Thank you. Uh, hello? Hello, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, f first of all, hello, David. Uh, first of all, I, I would like... Um, wait. Hello everyone, I would like to begin my speech by uh, thank you uh, for the invitation to participate in this panel uh, that talks about such an important topic as academic freedom. Uh, I was vice president of the National Students Union of Brazil and I had the opportunity to participate in some international student congress in Norway in Moscow, Russia, in Spain, here in Brazil, in South Africa, in Germany. And I was part of a group that tried to make a construction of a word forum on students and of a kind of document that bases our main struggle as a student movement, as a student organization. Um, and I, I was part of the group that wrote the Bergen Declaration, unit, Uniting for a Global Student Voice, uh, and the Moscow Declaration, that is Student Solidarity. Uh, and I was part of the small group with David and others that 
uh, made the actualization of the Magna Carta 2020 that they so well, has so well reported well now. Um, I believe that the construction of a global concept of academic freedom is very important. And I believe that this update involves the participation of politicians, politicians, as Livio commented in his presentation, but especially of the academic community as professors, researchers, and students. Uh, and I also believe that the civil society has a role in this process because as academic freedom is a public good, now the knowledge is a public good, it also affects people in civil society. Uh, I believe that documents such as those already mentioned are the basis for this construction, these actualizations that we can do. And I think that spaces like these are fundamental for us uh, to, to, to build like a common concept, like a, a, a world concept. And I, I, and I do believe that it's possible to do like a global concept of academic freedom because when I was part in Congress or seminars with students with all over the world, we face, we see that we face struggles that is very similar in our university, even if it's public or private university, even if it's like here in Brazil or in some country in Europe or in others in Africa or in Asia. So I think that if we face like struggles that is similar, uh, so it is possible, and I think that is fundamental uh, to to write um, a concept that can base like our our discussion. And I think that uh, it's important politicians be part of that because we have some countries like here in Brazil, for example, we faced in the past years uh, a government that attack the education, that attack knowledge, that attack science. And I think that if we have not just a declaration or just a concept, but if you have a law in our country that talk about that, the universities, the professor, they, they are a kind of in a safe place to do their job, to do their function as. Um, so I think that Bef after that we do a lot of discussions and I, I really um, I really hope that this is kind of a first discussion of others that will happen, not just in King's College, but in others university, not just in Europe, but here in Brazil and in Africa, in Asia, in Middle East, as, as the, the discussion that we did in the, the actualization of the Magna Carta. I think that it's also important that uh, with academics and students and, and researchers and professors, we discuss how that this freedom uh, can be like faced in the university. Like how that, for example, and this is a, a thing that we as students ask for that is right in the background declaration, for example, that how that we see the organizations of the students as part of the academic freedom. And, and I talk about that because I, I faced in some of the international seminars, students talking about how they try to organize in their university, how they try to uh, bring some things, some, some discussions in their space, but uh, sometimes they're not able to do that. And I think that um, this is also part of about academic freedom. And I think that we need to discuss how that the democratization of the access of the university is also about academic freedom because if academic freedom is about the build of knowledge, to be really like free, for example, we need to have the diversity of the society in this place that build the knowledge. 
So with this diversity of the society, we can like really build a concept and that we really can build a knowledge that is faced by all, not just I feel, because if we talk about academic freedom, but it's just one place, one social, uh, one kind of social group, one kind of gender, one kind of race that, that is in this place, building this knowledge, it's not about freedom at all. And I really appreciate when Liz, you talk about, for example, the colonization of education in the document that they say for us, because I, I really think that it's, it is about, about that. Too. So I will just uh, write, I, I want to read uh, a phase of our, of the document of Berger Declaration, and I will end my speech because I think that is the time. So. The Bergen Declaration states, the freedom to self-organize from the classroom to the campus is a basic right, and all students should have the space and tools available to do so. The students should be free to participate in public displays and demonstrations with repercussions. The student's ability to self-organize must be, must be reflected in their learning experience where students have the right to be represented by democratically elected representatives. A democratic education system promotes and protects students' representations on every level of governance within the student, within the institutions, and students should be treated as equal partners in their education. Unless academic freedom is upheld in our education systems, education is not truly free. We believe that campuses must be placed for debate and discussions where freedom of speech is forested and freedom of ideas is encouraged. Students have, students have the right to, to self-determine and self-produce needs on campus. So I will finish. Uh, talking that uh, in, in the seminars and congress with students that I was part uh, in many parts of the world, we discussed how academic freedom needs to be linked with democratization of education, of access of education, must be linked with the participations of students, but also the social uh, society in the discussion, and must be linked uh, with what do you believe that is knowledge and who is building this knowledge. So with diversity, with participation uh, of many parts of the world and many parts of the academic community, I think that we can really uh, build a concept that is global and that will be face it and follow by the academic community and the society of all over the world. So thank you for this uh, opportunity to talk about that. And I'm here to be the others. Thank you so much for your, you know, your infectious enthusiasm and your optimism and, and just opening up the debate to those bigger issues about the future of higher education and, and diversity and student participation. That's a really helpful contribution. We're going to stay online now. Um, we're going to move to Claire Robinson. And uh, just to remind you that she's Advocacy Director of the Scholars at Risk Network. Claire, it's lovely to have you with us. Thank you. It's lovely to be here or, well, I wish I was there, but um, it is lovely to be there online. So thank you. Um, and I assume everyone can hear me okay? We can hear you fine. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, so the question today, um, is there a need to reimagine academic freedom? I just, I first want to open uh, and comment, I guess, that, you know, as members of the higher education sector, we should be constantly reevaluating, reflecting, asking questions. So I am delighted that this is the topic of that reevaluation today. Um, so to answer this specific question, 
uh, it helps to assess where we are right now in terms of academic freedom within the higher ed education sector. And I'm going to do this through the lens of Scholars at Risk's work. Scholars at Risk um, is an international network of over 600 higher education institutions in 42 countries committed to protecting scholars and the freedom to think, question, and share ideas. Um, scholars at Risk conducts advocacy to protect these freedoms and to promote academic freedom. Our advocacy is rooted in um, what we call our academic freedom monitoring project. And this tracks, reports on, and encourages action around six different types of attacks that impact academic freedom and the health of the higher education community worldwide. These types of attacks are violence, killings and disappearances, wrongful prosecutions, wrongful imprisonments, restrictions on travel, retaliatory discharge, and other severe and systemic attacks on the sector. We summarize and analyze these attacks annually in our Free to Think report series. And Free to Think 2022, which was released four weeks ago, um, so very recent, um, it covers 391 attacks on higher education communities in 65 countries and territories from September 1st, 2021 through August 31st of this year. Uh, Free to Think demonstrates that these attacks occur in closed societies. They occur in times of war, as we have all seen in Ukraine this year. Um, they occur in times of political upheaval, but they also occur in, in more open societies, in more stable societies, in more democratic societies. In the past reporting year, um, attacks range from military occupation of campuses in Myanmar to bomb threats to historically black universities and colleges in the United States, um, from the tear gassing of student protesters in Sri Lanka to state interference in curricula and hiring in Nicaragua. So these and other incidents in Free to Think 2022 represent a wide cross sample of attacks on higher ed across the world. Beyond this event-based data at Scholars at Risk, we also see the severity of this global problem in the record number of applications for help that we've been receiving um, from at-risk scholars around the world. Um, so similarly, I should mention that we see deeply concerning findings in the Academic Freedom Index, a first of its kind, global data set of expert coded assessments of respect for academic freedom in 177 countries. The most recent annual data from the AFI on which SAR is an advocacy partner uh, show substantial declines in respect for academic freedom in 19 countries and territories since 2011, directly impacting over one third of the world's population. Taken together, this evidence demonstrates an overwhelming problem that impacts higher ed communities at the national, institutional, and individual levels. These attacks endanger the lives of scholars, students, and their families. They chill universities, they endanger academic freedom, without which quality research and education is not possible, open debate and discourse is stifled, and efforts to realize and defend democracy and human rights cannot progress and may indeed backslide. So this is the problem we are responding to today. It is global, it is pernicious, it impacts each and every one of us. So we ask if academic freedom needs to be reimagined. Perhaps the answer lies not in definitions and interpretations of academic freedom, but rather in a constant reevaluation of how we protect it. At this point in time, we find ourselves with three main challenges, many of, but some of which have been already discussed today. Um, the first challenge is the definition, um, given that as David mentioned, it varies across countries and cultures. Um, there are, however, numerous definitions in existence already, 
Um, there are numerous international and other legal standards that exist to protect academic freedom. Um, and if you look at our Free to Think report online, those, there is a chapter dedicated specifically to that question. The second challenge is limited data, though together Free to Think and the Academic Freedom Index have provided data and a summary of attacks and respect for academic freedom. And the third challenge is implementing protections for academic freedom. That is, how do we better secure the space that we all so value? Can universities and states proactively create an environment in which academic freedom is less vulnerable to these attacks? Scholars at Risk has been working in this field for over 20 years. And what we've seen in the last few years is a massive acceleration in the level of awareness attributed to academic freedom. But this is especially occurring at the state level within international and regional bodies as well. Um, several European bodies, for example, have issued guiding documents regarding academic freedom and Lviv went through several of, several of them, so I won't repeat that. Um, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights similarly issued or published last year, the Inter-American um, Principles on Academic Freedom and University Autonomy. And some of these bodies have even taken, uh, taken practical steps, including making suggestions for monitoring academic freedom. We absolutely welcome these developments, um, but we strongly incur, uh, sorry, we strongly encourage the higher education sector to offer its expertise as states and regional bodies develop policies and guidance in this area. Universities should share their experience defending academic freedom on campuses. They know the gaps. They know the pitfalls in ways that states don't. States and higher ed institutions must work together to protect the sector. So to conclude, more work is needed in all three of these challenge areas, the definition, the data, and the question of implementation. But given the urgency of the problem and the persistent nature of this global phenomenon, we view addressing implementation as most urgent. So as we chart this course, um, we must prioritize implementing academic freedom protections, something states and universities must do together. Thank you. Claire, thank you so much for setting out the challenges so clearly and uh, directing us in a particular way as well to how to, how to meet them. Uh, finally, it's a very great pleasure to introduce Professor Terence Caron, who's Professor of Higher Education Policy at the University of Lincoln and a leading expert on this subject. Thank You're you. Welcome. Um, before I start, I should like to thank Liviu Matai and colleagues at King's for inviting me to contribute to this debate on the very important topic of where we need to reimagine academic freedom. In her guidance to presenters, Linda advised us that we should make just one memorable point. However, I wish, if I may, to make two points during my five minutes. <laughs> my first point is that the answer to the question, do we need to reimagine academic freedom, is an unequivocal yes. I would argue that, in accordance with changes in the function and purposes of universities, academic freedom has been reimagined repeatedly in the past. Hence, for the proto-universities which emerged in the medieval Italian city-states, research was not a university function while university teaching, both as a skill and an occupation, was relatively underdeveloped and focused on vocational rather than academic learning. The main preoccupation in universities like Bologna and Padua with respect to academic freedom was the preservation of institutional and individual autonomy. To avoid control by the civic authorities, Bologna University, for example, held the city to ransom by migrating to other towns until its demands for greater control over the student were met. Tommaso Campanella's use of the concept libertas philosophandi in his 1622 defense of Galileo was the first reasoned argument to be published in support of the freedom of scientific investigation. This concept arose as a result of the controversies in European science 
in the post-Copernican region, sorry, period, rather than because of medieval tensions between universities and the church. However, the Reformation was instrumental in challenging the idea that there was a sole religious truth and in promoting a genuine search for the truth in the field of science. This free pursuit of the truth found its expression in the idea of a libertas philosophandi, which applied to individual scholars rather than to the university as an institution. Appeals from academics for greater academic freedom for their scientific endeavours grew louder as scientific research developed further. The importance of freedom for research was further argued in Wilhelm von Humboldt's famous memorandum of 1810 on a new university for Berlin, which is considered to be a manifesto for the modern university. Humboldt believed universities should be founded on freedom for teaching and research, and the unity between the two, whereby both students and professors are involved in a collaborative endeavor discovering the truth. Humboldt's work was highly influential in defining the rationale for academic freedom, not only in Europe, but more particularly in the United States. The growth in the focus of universities in the post-war period led to Clark Kerr's concept of the multiversity. His book, The Uses of the University, argued that the idea of the university as a community of scholars dedicated to knowledge for its own sake, as classically developed by Humboldt, had ceased to exist. Kerr's insights were drawn from his experience of the American Research University. But there is a worldwide trend towards the multiversity being shaped by globalizing trends in higher education that are transforming both individual universities and national higher education systems alike. The rise of neoliberalism in the 1970s allied to the massification of higher education and the evolution of the university towards the knowledge factory, which Kerr had in fact predicted, have all had profound effects on universities and academic freedom. Universities are now global icons for the intellectual achievements of nation states. Towns like Oxford are now international university, in which the university is the larger employer, and it is expected to promote the regional economy, but also provide solutions to contemporary global problems. Hence, in this brief historical overview, we can see that the relative importance of different aspects of academic freedom has altered over time in line with changes in the purpose and function of universities. This brings me to my second memorable point. It is certain that the rate of such changes to the university, and thereby to academic freedom, will accelerate further in the future. Information and communication technologies facilitate the ever faster creation of new knowledge by enabling research findings to circulate seamlessly, ceaselessly across the knowledge economy between collaborating universities and also private companies. Such research collaborations may be commercially confident and thereby negate the ability of academics to freely demonstrate their research findings within academia. Moreover, these technologies are now having an impact on methods of teaching <coughs> via the greater use of e-learning. Many university teachers have little knowledge of learning theory and limited experience of writing and using open and distance learning materials. This may have altered because of the COVID pandemic, which forced many universities to teach online. However, this raises the question, should we still grant university teachers the freedom to determine how a course may be taught when they may not know the best way to teach by means of information and communication technologies? In conclusion, academics have reimagined academic freedom in the past in response in changes in the purpose and functions of university. In the future, it will be incumbent upon us all to try to anticipate the changes in how universities undertake their functions of teaching and research and take positive action to reimagine academic freedom to ensure that it's not further undermined. Academic freedom is of the few but for the many. Like many liberties, academic freedom is fragile and once removed, it will probably be much more difficult to reinstate than it was to achieve in the first place. Thank you.
Thank you so much. I'm glad you ignored me. Uh, <laughs> two very good points. Um, I think you'll agree it's been, a, it's been a fantastic opening to this really important topic, and we've heard a whole range of important considerations here. We have got a nice amount of time now for some discussion and some Q&A. We've got a good half hour. Um, and so I'd like to invite that, please. Have a think about your questions. People online, um, you can write in the chat, and we will read out some questions. And I think there's scope for people to actually speak as well, if they want to. Is that right? So they, you, if you want to actually speak from on, online, please just indicate that in the chat. And, um, or raise your little hand, your little, yeah, electronic hand. Is that the way to do it? Okay. And um, can you be aware as well that this is being recorded? It's being recorded online, but it's also being recorded in this, in this room. So if you, if you speak, it, it will be recorded. And it'll be used when to, it'll be available. Yeah. So um, who would like to start us off? Um, the way I'm going to do it, I think I'll take a, a couple of questions uh, and then direct it to an appropriate person. And if there's someone you particularly wanted to address it to, just let me know. So please, could you introduce yourself um, and speak sure. loudly? Sure, so my name there's, is... There's, uh, a, there's a microphone. I don't need a microphone. But for colleagues online, okay. we need a microphone. My name is uh, Robert Jenso. Thanks so much for the discussion. It's been very, very interesting and insightful. So my question is to Professor Shitish Kapoor who has mentioned in his opening uh, speech that there needs to be a distinction between academic freedom and, uh, and freedom of speech. And so my question is to you, Professor, how do you think that it is possible to distinguish uh, between the both when, you know, Mill has also highlighted the importance of freedom of speech as being uh, conducive to intellectual flourishing as it allows for debate and open discussion. And I'd also like to... Um, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, that's, that's yeah, yeah, question. maybe, question. maybe a, another question. question as well. Only one question each. Thank you very much. That's a very clear one. So, could we take the next one? Just, just beside you. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Naomi Waltham Smith. I'm the academic freedom lead at the University of Warwick. Um, my question's for Livy, uh, specifically about your suggestion that academic freedom should extend to students. Uh, I could say a few things about this, but I'll try and keep it brief. Um, I'm thinking particularly about the way in which a rationale for academic freedom is often based on professional expertise. The Stanley Fish, it's just a job kind of model that is often mentioned, but also in the Strasbourg court. But then secondly, the other justification that academic freedom is a labor relation, evidenced by the fact that one of the cheaper, uh, greatest threats to academic freedom today is deteriorating working conditions. So I was wondering, as you're reimagining academic freedom, how would you you develop a kind of rationale that justified that extension to students, but taking in mind those two kind of core uh, professional rationales for academic freedom. Thank you. Thank you both very much. I'm going to take those two together, and I'm going, um, I think, Livia, you, you could probably handle both of them, and then I'll invite Shitaj if he wants to come in as well. Well, sure. There's no need to help my president, but I, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to, 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 to comment on this. So I think that this is one of the most serious dangers of our times to restrict academic freedom to freedom of speech or misconstrue academic freedom to f as, as freedom of, uh, of speech out of good intentions very, very often. And let me give you just a couple of examples why they are not the same. And this also takes me to the point about the scope of academic freedom must include students. So, you know, academic freedom and freedom of speech overlap partially. And freedom of speech is absolutely important. We should not disregard it, but they are not the same. Does academic freedom include the right to choose your research question? Yes. It's not a matter of freedom of speech. You may study something that leads to nothing to communicate. But if we say, no, that, that, that is not covered by freedom of speech. Or you know, does it include the right of students to choose what they study? There are countries where the government decides. No, there is a national a test, a national ranking. First 100 are sent to study medicine, whether they like it or not. Other, the next 100 are sent to study, the, usually medicine is first, then there are technical disciplines, social sciences, humanities are at the bottom. Uh, and that is a matter of academic freedom, I believe, you know, 
even under the Humboldtian model, and it is not a matter of, of freedom of, of speech. So if we, if we say they are the same, we actually restrict the scope of, uh, of uh, academic freedom, which does not mean that there are no elements of uh, freedom of speech within academic freedom. They are, and they should be, they should be considered. But uh, you know, I, perhaps I'll come back to, to another short idea here. And I already spoke about, about, uh, about students. Academic freedom is about right to education, right to study, right to research. It's also, I should say, about governance the right to participate in university governance for all internal constituencies. Now, this is not easy to, to, to discuss, and it's a little bit on purpose that I didn't mention it in my intervention, the governance uh, uh, aspect, you know, the UNESCO the, uh, uh, recommendation touches on that. But, you know, if academic freedom is this precondition for the production, transmission, dissemination of knowledge as a public good, we cannot exclude students out of there because they are the ones who, who learn, right? They are the ones who participate through the production of, of knowledge as well. So you are right that you know, it, you know, there should be a place, in, including in this discussion that we are having uh, about how to reimagine academic freedom, for members of internal university constituencies to participate not only as individuals, but also through their structures or structured forms of, uh, of association. And that includes the student union. I don't know whether there is anybody from the King's Student Union here, but I know there are colleagues from the European Student Union attending online. There should be a, a, a room for uh, trade unions to, to, to participate to, to this discussion as well. And I believe there are uh, uh, representatives from the leadership of uh, UCU attending at least uh, uh, online. And, and by the way, I should have said that uh, UCU has uh, made a big contribution to this European reference for, for, uh, for, uh, for academic freedom. We made friends, you know, which I would, would have never expected. I, no, uh, I, I should not say anything about this. Can you so, just explain what UCU is for all uh, Know. The University and College uh, Union here in the in the UK. I think you you did say UCU, right? So I realize mm. I have never uttered mm. publicly the the the, uh, the name. So yes, so the, it is it is quite a challenge how to ensure participation, if not representation, not only of individuals representing all constituencies, but their organization, including professional organizations in in higher education. So you know. Association of Psychologists should have a role, the League of Research Intensive Universities. And this takes me to my very last point. It looks terribly messy, right? And it looks messy because there are so many elements here. So is academic freedom a human right? Is it a governance principle? Is it a value? Is it for students? Is it for the public? What is it? And some some of us say, well, it's, let's focus on one thing, human rights, that's good, it helps us for example, with regard to implementation. Others say, well, academic freedom is so many things that it doesn't make sense. It's like a kaleidoscope. You remember that uh, children toy, whenever you shake it, you have a different conf configuration, and after a few exercises, like, you get dizzy. So, you know, it, it's, it's too many things. Others, and I side with this, say, well, it's rather like a Rubik's Cube. Not with that many faces like the cube invented by uh, Mr. Rubik, perhaps with fewer, and it is possible to, 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 to make a case about how they should be articulated. And I believe this is, a, this is a wonderful subject for research and a very important contribution that research should make. You know, I have many years until I can get a sabbatical to, to focus on this, so I have to work on that uh, uh, now. But how do we articulate this and what facets of this should be more salient and used for the purpose of conceptualization, regulation. Because yes, there is a, there is freedom of speech, but there. But where where there is, does it does it belong in the conceptualization, regulation, and then practice and and implement? I Thank think you. this great. is a We've very got, important. Let's take a few more. That's research. Right. That, um, uh, do you want to say anything, yeah, okay. Professor Capo? No, sorry. No, let's we'll take some new ones. Shitish, do you want to make any comment or? No. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, there's one here, please. Um, can you wait for the microphone? And then there's one, yes, just, just there. Yep. Um, well, thank you for. My name's Anne Corbett. I'm from LSE. Um, thank you very much for the start to all of this, which I think has been incredibly stimulating. Um, 
my question relates to the fact that I can quite I can really understand the need for a reconceptualization of is it can you hear me yes yes of academic freedom and I think what David Locke was saying about the changed social conditions is absolutely relevant to all of this in my researches I met some of the charming men who actually wrote the original Magna Carta um, and of course they were still functioning in quite an elite a structure of universities um, where they could actually assume that people would respect knowledge and that would be a form of academic freedom. But the question that really um, <clears throat> uh, keeps me wondering is what about the kind of how do you make a conceptualization of academic freedom respected? Um, Livio knows only too well the situation in Hungary. Um, but I think one can also raise the question in, in uh, overtly democratic societies. Um, it is a form of contract. It is a form of political agreement that this should happen. How do you do it? Thank you very much. And then there's one over on the right-hand side, my right. Hi, uh, my name's Sunday Blake. I'm from Wonky. Um, there was a comment on diversity earlier, which I was really interested in, and the positive uh, impact a diverse academic community has on research and knowledge production. Um, and there were some later comments on governance, uh, student participation, and academic freedom. Um, and there were also some comments <laughs> on collectively and individually engaging in, with students and students' rights to academic uh, freedom as well. Now, we know that co-produced co mo modules tend to be of a higher quality uh, and meaningful student engagement as part of the sort of QAA framework. My question is, where does that co-creation happen and how do we uphold academic freedom in it when courses are sort of largely designed and ticked off by governance structures before they're imparted. So if a course can be written on the fly and delivered in co-production with students, according to the diversity and academic interests of the students in the room, how much of this content would depart from what was originally agreed? And how can we ensure that institutions are empowered to maintain quality, which is a regulatory requirement, uh, through academic freedom? Thank you very much. Um, David. Could you have a go at those, both of those? Well, I'll, I'll have a go at the first one. And uh, it's, delight, it's a delight for me to see Anne in the flesh because we have spoken um, in, in the past. And thank you for that question, which I think is at the heart of it. And I think you've summed it up very well by this move from the elitism and the way in which academic freedom was important for that, to this move to universities serving society and your, your question about, you know, how do we make such a conception, how, how do we enable that to be received? Well, I'm going to take you back to Magna Carta 2020 and universities serving society and to serve society universities need to connect with society and in another presentation which I make I talk about stakeholders of universities how there's becoming more of them and how they're actually becoming more important and how universities need to engage with them without compromising their academic freedom and you'll you all know some of the cases where money can be perceived to influence research and how universities have actually to protect about that but in this move to universities serving society that kind of dialogue is necessary and an, another point there is no earthly point in universities employing the best brains in the world if those brains are not then allowed to function and to determine the things which academic freedom permits them to determine. So to answer your question, it's about engagement. 
Uh, it's about engagement with society, engagement with professions. I would add engagement with students as, as a very important stakeholder group in, in all of this. Thank you. And um, the, the question about regulation, compliance, even quality assurance, and how that might not allow for uh, academic freedom, particularly in the part of student and collaboration. Um, I don't know if, if Claire or Tamires want to talk a bit about that, or one of the panel. Just do, do, do internal regulations in universities today fight against academic freedom? They can do. It all depends who couches them and how they're couched. Yeah. Um, some institutions do have academic freedom statements, but often these aren't particularly well drafted. Most academics don't really know much about academic freedom. Mm -hmm. That's, That's a, a real key problem. Point. Yeah. And we did a, a survey point. of Euro European academics, and yeah, well over 60% said they don't really know very much about it, what it means. And if they don't know what it is, how can they protect it? It's very difficult. And clearly, mm. where there mm. are problems with respect to freedom of speech mm. and academic freedom, uh, Michael Olivas, who's uh, an American scholar, said very well, I think, uh, freedom of speech and academic freedom are cousins, but they're not twins. Mm. And that encapsulates exactly mm. what they are, I think. Yeah. And th I think there are clear differences between the two myself. And it's a, it's a contrast, actually, with the press and the media for whom press freedom and freedom, I think, is much more meaningful than it is for academics. Um, in academic freedom. Okay, um, do we need to go to the online? No, just no, about just the about students' it. participation. I, I believe that academic freedom, as was said, is about governance too. Uh, so when I when I read the the phrase of Bergen Declaration that uh, the students' movement uh, believes that a student must be part of the body of the, the universe, for example. We have university consuls, we have different kind of consuls university, and it's very important to have even one representation or two, and that this representation of students be chosen by the students, not be appointed for someone of the, of the direction of the university. So uh, I think that, that's why I told about diversity and about democracy of access uh, when we talk about academic freedom, because I think it's important uh, when we discuss about that, we, we have the representation of all the bodies in, the, in this discussion, in this governance too. And, and uh, about the, the first question, I think that uh, uh, the participation of civil society in this discussion is important because of that. Because if we just uh, talk about academic freedom in the few people that have access of university, uh, this won't be like a public good. This is not about acknowledge because not everyone, not everybody have access of what is talking in the university. So. We need to build also some kind of tools. Maybe the the civil society councils, or, or I don't know, uh, that make people that even didn't finish their college uh, have access to know what is that and why this is important. Because if we don't have the civil society knowing about that and know the importance about that, we will keep having um, countries uh, that are faced in, in, in government that like arrested, that even kill people that are formulated some complex and some different uh, things and, and, and knowledge, you know. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, there is one question online um, from the, the people join, who's joined us um, online and it was very much related to what you were discussing around the situation in uh, more Western societies, but particularly in Britain, um, they were asking if we can say that academic freedom is under threat and if so, um, what does the panel think about the bill? Will it help to protect it? Thank you very much. Who, who would like to take that one? It's very difficult to say because currently the bill is kind of stalled and there are rumours about changes to it.
But for, for, from my own perception, there are clear differences between academic freedom and freedom of speech. And the government didn't really understand these. And they put together this bill. And they were also impacted by various right-wing pressure groups with respect to this that had some kind of an effect. Academic freedom is a professional freedom granted to people to undertake their functions of teaching and research on the basis of their professional knowledge and expertise. It is different from freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is a generic freedom given to everyone in order to express themselves. Academics have to speak truthfully, whereas freedom of speech needn't be. For example, a comedian, when he gets up and tells a funny story, he's exercising freedom of speech, but in no sense is he peer-reviewed. And that, again, is another difference between what academics do and also freedom of speech. We only say what we think is correct, and we know it's correct, based on our knowledge. And that knowledge is, in essence, peer-reviewed. The rest of people undertaking freedom of speech do not do that at all. And there are clear differences. I think the current legislation merely muddies the water. And when it first came out, the UCU said, why, why are you trying to fix something that isn't broken? And I think that's absolutely accurate. I'm going to take some, the final round of questions, and then I'm going to invite everyone on the panel to make a, a quick comment. Um, we have one here, please. You are first. I saw you first. And then a uh, gentleman over there. And Shitted, yes. <clears throat> Could you... Use the microphone and microphone. introduce yourself, please. Yes, my name is Franz Burkhardt. I work here at King's, and I used to have responsibility for freedom of expression at the university. Um, so my, I was very interested with this notion of f academic freedom being something different in different contexts. It, I think the, the new definition suggests that it needs to, um, you know, uh, be be in the context of, of a culture or a, or, or a national setting, suggesting that there are many different types of academic freedom, or at least that there are, there are shades of it. And I wondered whether that is a problem, um, and whether the way you need to get to that is really the definition of what is a public good, that in different countries or different cultures or different settings, historic or whatever, actually the definition of what is a public good may differ. Uh, we've had all the you know, recent arguments about armbads in, in Qatar. I can quite imagine that there's a different notion of the public good of knowledge in some societies than in others. Mm, thank you. That's been coming through. Uh, the gentleman just in this middle row there. Thanks. I'm uh, Harry Anderson from uh, Universities UK. I'm, I suppose, particularly interested in this sort of discussion around universities needing to play quite an active role in, in sort of shaping the narrative and the debate and definitions of, of academic freedom. And, you know, I think I would wholeheartedly agree with that. The, the challenge, I suppose, I throw back is that, you know, we've touched on the, the legislation that's going through Parliament. That's partly driven by a perception, at least, that universities perhaps, you know, aren't trusted on this topic or that, um, that you know, we have a vested interest in, in sort of perhaps, uh, you know, uh, being from a particular political persuasion, or or, or what have you, and I, you know, I think we've already heard about the the legislation being driven by certain sort of think tanks. I guess how do universities respond to that challenge then, if we're not, if we can't be sort of trusted to begin with in terms of defining this this topic? Thank you. And Professor Kapoor in the front row, please. Thank you. Um, my question to the panel is on this issue of professional competence or you know, that academic freedom is granted to you within your range of scholarly expertise. How and who gets to decide what is your range of scholarly expertise? A very good uh, set of closing questions, and I'm going to invite the panel. They can respond to any, any they wish. Um, we're, we're just about on time, but you've got about a minute each. Um, let's go in the order that you spoke, sure. please. So... Uh, very short and, 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 and rapidly. The bill on the freedom of speech is not on the freedom of speech and is not on academic freedom. It is a bill on the freedom of speech on campus. That's what it is, as a matter of fact. Although it muddies the water, waters by presenting itself or being presented as, uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, something else. So who decides? Who gets to, to decide? And one problem with the existing conceptualizations of, uh, of academic freedom is that they see 
uh, science and, and, and higher education as different entities. So the freedom of speech sees academic freedom as sees science and higher education as discourse. While in reality it is a social, situated, complex social practice. So this is where we should look at who decides, and I would say very simply, it's the academic parts of the academic communities that decide on standards, and that can be professional associations, um, uh, promotion committees. So it's not a fixed body that decide on standards, and these standards are uh, evolving. But if they are not there, then you know academic freedom, uh, you know, loses its its its, uh, its substance. Isn't Thank it? you. David. The key word for me out of this last set of questions is the word trust. And the key caution is not to overgeneralize. I think universities have demonstrated the trust of society in a general way by the very fact that they've been around much longer than governments, much longer than a number of cities and certainly corporations. So I think that concept of trust is important. Now, how do we maintain that trust? Well, a phrase which is often used is that we should use our freedoms responsibly. Now, I appreciate that there's loads in that, there's loads in that that's difficult. What do you mean by it, and so on. But if we are asking ourselves the question, am I using my freedom so that my university can best serve society? And in doing what I'm doing, am I doing it as responsibly as I can do? Then I think we will go a long way to build and maintain trust. Thank you very much. Tamiris, would you like a final word? Oh, you're muted. OK. Uh, I, I, I just would like to say like, thank you. And I think that these, the, the questions and the answers that were made here uh, give us the answer that it's really important not just to reevaluate, but to discuss about what is the conception of academic freedom. And I think that this is a good start. And I'm happy to be part of it. Thank, Thank you, you so much for taking part. And Claire. Primarily in response to the comment that David addressed as well, that universities may not be trusted at this point in time um, to move this question forward. Perhaps it is a question of being proactive and not necessarily always responsive and defensive of the space, but rather taking the initiative, involving the diverse voices that we have discussed here um, and demonstrating the value of the university's contributions to society. And with that foundation, making the case for increased protections for academic freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Finally, Terence. Uh, I think if we as academics are not willing to stand up for academic freedom, what example are we passing on to those whom we teach? That's another reason for doing it. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed that. It's a taster. There will be more debates. Um, but thank you so much for joining us online or in person. I think it's been a terrific debate. I'm extremely grateful to everyone who organised, everyone in the room supporting, uh, everyone online, and to our panel members. And could you join me in giving them a round of applause?